Good morning. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. It's uh, pretty many people. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so today I'm going to present, present uh, my uh, uh, PhD in defense defense. Uh, my work is related to study of two-dimensional perovskites from the point of view how an organic uh, part of it can affect its properties. Here is the outline of the presentation. I will start with some uh, background and motivation. Then I will tell the three projects that are connected by the same idea on uh, how we can alter the properties of two-dimensional perovskites, changing uh, their uh, organic cation and combining with organic cations. Then uh, I will go to conclusions and some ideas for future work. First, introduction. Uh, uh, in general, perovskites are called uh, after a uh, mineral perovskite. And uh, uh, there is a class of materials with this name that is connected by its structure. So the general formula of the perovskite is ABX3, mm -hmm. where B is a small cation, cation that is uh, 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 surrounded by six anions. Uh, forming an amphitheater that are connected to each other by corners. And inside of these cubicular uh, cavities, there is a bigger cation A. To make this uh, perovskite halide, the anion should be halide, uh, chlorine, uh, bromine, or iodine. Uh, cation B is usually red or tin, and cation A can be either uh, some metal, like a large metal, metal like video. Uh, but to make it hybrid, organic and inorganic, it should be an organic cation that can fit into this cavity. It's uh, usually nickel ammonium or aluminum material. Uh, this is nickel ammonium. Uh, why these uh, materials uh, become important in, in the last 10 years? Because uh, in 2009, uh, people have found out that they uh, can be a very good absorbers for solar cells. And since then, in about 10 years, its efficiency increased uh, up to 25.5% in single junction solar cells and uh, up to almost 30% in tandem solar cells with silicon. Uh, but uh, besides solar cells, it can be applied in uh, uh, other devices, for example, LEDs. Also recently, the emission efficiency of perovskite has reached uh, uh, over 20%. And uh, another good advantage is that uh, these materials are really cheap and easy to produce from directly from solution. Uh, for example, silicon is much more difficult. Uh, uh, Besides these two main applications, these materials can be also applied in skin tronic, skin lasing, in, in uh, light detection, and so on. And this is possible because this class of materials has a very uh, important advantage, tunability. Changing the composition, uh, we can uh, change the properties a lot. We can change the absorption, emission energy, fan gap, uh, and uh, uh, like films, film orientation, many other factors. And uh, uh, beside this, there is one more way of uh, tunability, to, to, to tune the properties. This is uh, going to the lower dimensional perovskites. Uh, cutting, imaginary cutting the structure along the uh, uh, crystallographic planes or axes, we can get two dimensional structure, one dimension, zero dimension, where this uh, will be our perovskite and the uh, uh, in between, there is an organic layer of some organic larger cations that cannot fit into the cavity. And uh, my work is uh, related to this uh, two-dimensional perovskites. Uh, and uh, they have some uh, special uh, uh, points about them. First of all, when we go from three-dimensional perovskite to the 2D, uh, this new material form a natural quantum well structure because the uh, semiconductor is the inorganic and the organic layer works as an insulator. And as a result, we have a wider band gap and a stable excitons of this material. Uh, secondly, uh, this, uh, those materials uh, can have improved stability due to uh, hydrophobic, uh, due to the fact that the organic cations are hydrophobic and uh, moisture is the main reason of, degra main reason of degradation in uh, two-dimensional perovskites. And finally, uh, uh, in 2D perovskite, there is one more way of tunability. Uh, coming from this uh, typical uh, so-called n equals to 1 perovskite, we can also have uh, so-called n equals to 2, n equals to 3 perovskite, where the number of octahedral layers within one inorganic layer can, is 1, 2, 3. Uh, so in this case, the interlayer molecules are uh, some large, long organic cations, and inside of the inorganic layers, there is still uh, nickel ammonium, for example. And uh, another way is uh, besides these planar structures, 
this to different aspect can have uh, uh, different uh, more complex way of connection, like here, corrugated structure, uh, for three and three. Uh, then, um, uh, and uh, the next question, as, as I explained here, the properties are, uh, the semiconducting properties are inside of the inorganic layer. And uh, what is the organic layer? What does, what does it do? Uh, uh, in, uh, in general, we believe that the main, that uh, conduction band and valence band are determined by the uh, PB and IOD and PB and halide points. And uh, for example, band gap can be changed by changing the angle PB IOD angle. Uh, so the, uh, in general, we believe that organic cation can, uh, depending on its, on its geometry, it can change its angle. And uh, uh, in my work, I'm trying to study how else uh, the organic time can affect it, how, how, else it can, how else it can affect the structure, and how else the properties can, be, can uh, depend on its properties. So the first project I'm going to talk about is uh, about the uh, uh, perovskite with uh, two different organic times and effect of disordering of these organic times. Then the second project is uh, about uh, uh, perovskite with uh, uh, a long organic time uh, that is soft, and some mechanical properties of organic and inorganic layer are very different. And we will try to study how uh, it uh, responds to high pressure. And finally, uh, the other project is about uh, the corrugated perovskite and the uh, in-plane and such of Yeah, let's go to project number one. Um, uh, I will start with some background of this topic too. Uh, so, uh, as I told, the three D perovskites are known for some time and uh, have been quite uh, well studied. This uh, perovskite and ammonium uh, lead iodide, for example, uh, or bromide, they have a cubic structure at the room temperature, some lower, uh, lower uh, symmetry structures at low temperature, and uh, at room temperature, the ammonium is disordered. And uh, this is related to the fact that the structure is cubic and uh, it's related to its band gap. And uh, uh, our colleague, uh, uh, she used to be in our group, she studied this material and she has found out that this disordering and the phase transitions from cubic to lower symmetry is very related to the state of nickel ammonium. At room temperature, when it's disordered, uh, uh, there is no hydrogen bonding. At lower temperature, especially in the thrombic phase, uh, it, uh, the uh, both ends of nickel ammonium are bonded through hydrogen bonds to the inorganic structure, and this uh, decreases the disorder. Uh, and uh, uh, my project is about 2D perovskite, where we have uh, these two layers. So we have nickel ammonium, similar to 3D, but also we have the cumulative ammonium, that is a larger cation that uh, uh, doesn't have this degrees of freedom, of, for example, of rotation, and uh, it also affects the structure somehow. And uh, so how it affects the structure? Uh, the 3D perovskite at room temperature is uh, nearly cubic, while the 2D perovskite is already similar to the low temperature phase of the 3D perovskite. And so the question is, uh, what, what's happening, what's going on with nickel ammonium in this material? Because it differs from 3D. But we know that from 3D it's water, so how it affects the 2D structure. And secondly, what's going on with the cumulative ammonium? And how? All these uh, two cations, uh, are, uh, what is the correlation with their optical properties? Uh, so first we studied, uh, we uh, used Raman spectroscopy to, uh, the first step to make assignment of the Raman peaks. So the, this, uh, this two uh, uh, Raman spectra uh, for N equals to two perovskite uh, at the room at low temperature. And uh, the, this one, it's for n equals to so-called n equals to one perovskite where there is no nickel ammonium. So the peaks that are presented only in these two graphs and uh, not here, they are from nickel ammonium. So we can see that there is there are four peaks that are only present in this spectrum, and uh, these peaks are more intensive only at low temperature. So then we studied this uh, dependence uh, uh, with uh, in this te several temperatures. And uh, you can see that uh, when this is high temperature, this is low temperature, when the temperature goes down at around 200 Kelvin, these peaks that were assigned to nickel ammonium, they start to increase its intensity. 
uh, this uh, change is uh, uh, related to, uh, so the peak intensity can be explained by uh, the vibrations becoming more harmonical. When they're unharmonical, they're broad and weak. When they're harmonical, they are uh, sharper. And uh, this uh, harmonical uh, means that the molecule becomes more frozen, more confined to the structure, and the hydrogen bonding is formed. Uh, and uh, this uh, three peaks that change intensity, they are all related to the vibrations of methyl ammonia. This one, uh, that is stretching NH, and uh, this uh, two, they involve uh, some bending and rocking of the NH3 channel. So uh, we can say that below 200 Kelvin, some changes start to appear in the structure that involve the uh, uh, confining of the NH3 end of the ammonia. And, uh, uh, but this is not a sudden change, it's, uh, it's quite a continuous change. And then we performed uh, a calorimeter study to find out if there is a phase transition or not. And we found a very broad phase transition that happens uh, in the range from about 200 Kelvin, that coincides with Raman data, to about 150 Kelvin. And uh, uh, then we found similar changes uh, in uh, uh, photoluminescence and absorption speed. Uh, also, at room temperature below 200 K, there is almost no change in the PL intensity. Then, in the range between 150 and 200 Kelvin, there is a continuous change that coincides with this. And then uh, there is a blue shift of the property. So, uh, this phase transition does affect the optical properties of the material, although this change isn't as great as the phase transition that happened in 3D probe sky. And finally, uh, an interesting point that we figure out that in this uh, high temperature and low temperature phase, uh, the uh, recombination mechanism seems to be different because uh, we used our annulus plot to predict the intensity versus temperature and this gives uh, the activation energy of uh, uh, like two, uh, two times different. Uh, yeah, so again, just briefly to conclude, we study this material, there is a phase transition, the broad phase transition below 200 Kelvin uh, uh, that uh, doesn't seem to involve the annulus ammonium, but it does involve methyl ammonium and is ordering and uh, changing to a more confined state. And this is correlated with the optical properties. Uh, project number two is about in-plane anisotropy. So another 2D peroxide, uh, this one, it, uh, its uh, uh, organic time is in the uh, In contrast with the previous one, we have uh, uh, two ends uh, that are positively charged. And this very cation forms the 2D peroxide structure with the corrugated areas. Uh, so this is a side view. Uh, each layer, each level looks something like this, like, like folds. Uh, then uh, I noticed that uh, its structure is similar to the structure of black phosphorus. And black phosphorus is one of the most uh, well-known uh, materials with in-plane anisotropy. Uh, uh, and uh, so the question was whether this peroxide also exhibits in-plane anisotropy. Uh, I should know that in general, all 2D perovskite are anisotropic in its nature already because the deep plane uh, is a semiconductor, out of plane is a, a quantum well structure. Uh, but in plane, anisotropy is even more important because uh, when we grow films, uh, they normally are in plane oriented and uh, the crystals are also flake shaped and they're also in plane oriented. So for applications, this is important. Uh, and to study optical anisotropy, we performed polarization uh, of result experiment. Each its uh, scheme is shown here. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the scheme of what their corrugated crystal. And uh, then we have a laser line that is polarized, and we can rotate the polarization of this layer of uh, the laser, changing the angle between the laser polarization and the crystallographic axis in the crystal. Uh, so uh, please note that the in-plane axis. B and C. A is out of plane. So we will con compare B and C directions. First, uh, we studied Raman spectroscopy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, in some sense, it's a structural method. So uh, if uh, the structure is anisotropic, Raman will be also anisotropic. And you can see that uh, these peaks that correspond to the inorganic vibrations, uh, when we rotate the polarization of the, la of the laser, uh, the uh, intensity, the relative intensity of peak change example, along B axis, the strongest peak is this one. Along uh, when we rotate and go to C axis, uh, the strongest peaks are these two. And uh, this uh, maybe a bit com complicated picture 
shows uh, the uh, angular dependence in, uh, in the polar coordinates of uh, uh, most of the other peaks, both organic and inorganic. You can see that there, uh, uh, the peaks uh, dependencies are different, so it depends on the symmetry of each operation. Uh, the more interesting and applied um, uh, point about this material is that we figured out the anisotropy of the optical properties. In this slide, uh, you can see the uh, reflectivity spectra uh, at uh, low temperature, also with the different uh, uh, excitation of the different polarization of the excitation laser. Um, uh, and uh, uh, even without any analysis, you can see that around the axis, the uh, resonances are weaker, and uh, there is mostly uh, one, one uh, strong resonance, while at uh, Excitation along C axis, uh, there is a stronger, broader resonance, and also there is one more. Uh, then, uh, to, to extract uh, the physical parameters from their reflectivity spectra, uh, performed a Kramer scoring analysis. And in this uh, picture, you can see the extracted absorption coefficient from their reflectivity spectra. And uh, at excitation B axis, there is only one distinct resonance. While with excitation along C axis, you can see one, two, and uh, one more resonance that can be resolved in some of the angles. Uh, so we call this uh, with the energy decrease E1, E2, and E3. To assign these uh, resonances, uh, we performed uh, uh, DFT calculations, uh, thanks to my collaborator, uh, Dr. Yang. Uh, um, uh, so uh, from the DFT calculations, you can manipulate uh, uh, in, no. uh, So we can see that when the excitation happens along B, we also have only one resonance. When the excitation happens along C, we have two resonances. And the first uh, peak, uh, the first exciton, uh, its weight function is plotted in this figure. We can see that it exists in both directions along C axis. And along B axis. And if you consider exciton 3, its seven function is only along C axis. That's why we don't see this resonance with excitation on B axis. However, uh, the uh, uh, component E2 wasn't uh, found from the uh, from the DFT calculations, but this is not the first evidence of this component in general in the different skies. There are several evidences of the fine structure of excitonic peak at the lower temperature. And uh, 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 it's still a question. Uh, there is no real answer about it. Most probably, most, most probably it is some polaronic uh, related effects. Uh, the next uh, uh, interesting finding here is uh, uh, how the photoluminescence is dependent on the excitation uh, polarization too. Uh, even without uh, uh, fitting, that you can see that the energy addition changes. Uh, and uh, we try to explain it. And the first idea is that it can be the contribution of the component E2 uh, that was also angle dependent. And to confirm or to, uh, to say that this is not the, the point, we, uh, first of all, we compared the uh, PL and absorption uh, excited along B and C axis. And we can see that uh, the absorption that includes E2 component is much broader. So there is obviously no uh, uh, additional component uh, as uh, shifted uh, from the main peak as in case of absorption. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, how else we try to apply it? So we assume that there are two components that are separated by about, uh, twen uh, about 20 uh, uh, EV, that is actually even less than uh, from the optical absorption, and try to simulate how the PL spectra would look if uh, it were the case of two components. And you can see that if it were the case, there would be two uh, low resolved peak, although we don't have it in our case. So uh, the component is two, uh, E2 doesn't uh, contribute the PL intensity of this. It isn't uh, resolved in uh, 80 Kelvin where these measurements were performed. Uh, then uh, to also to try to, to find, to figure out the the origin of this component, we performed uh, temperature-dependent photoluminescence study of this material. Uh, uh, in uh, 
uh, you can see that with temperature decrease, the peaks become more narrow, and also the separation between the, between them also becomes less and less. Uh, and also can be seen here from the extraction of the peak energy. Uh, secondly, the uh, uh, PL intensity, uh, uh, the activation energy for both components is similar, and uh, the uh, uh, the most important difference, in my opinion, is that uh, the uh, dependence of uh, the broadening of the peaks with temperature increase has a different uh, behavior when measured excited along B direction and along C direction, as in this graph. Then they performed more uh, accurate analysis of these two uh, dependencies, applying a uh, deformation, deformation potential model. Uh, so what is deformation potential? This is a model that can explain the broadening of the peak due to coupling of the charges or excitons to phonons. And uh, uh, it can happen to all kinds of uh, phonons, usually to optical, uh, HO, LO, TO, and so on. For perovskites, this was shown that it mostly happens to homopolar optical phonons. And um, so when the vibration happens, the uh, structure is, uh, at this very moment of the vibration, it's, it's, it's modified. And so its electronic structure is also modified. So depending on the vibration, the bands and the band structure can uh, become higher or lower and so on. And that's why we have the broadening of the peak. Uh, there are uh, several, com uh, several contributions to uh, the broadening. Uh, the first one is to the broadening at zero, uh, at, uh, zero K, the full wave maximum, then uh, coupling to acoustic phonons to optical phonons and to impurities. The coupling to acoustic, to acoustic phonons uh, uh, makes the dependence linear. Uh, the coupling to impurities uh, creates this kind of dependence, and coupling to uh, phonons create this kind of dependence. Uh, to decrease the number of the parameters uh, in, in the fitting, we neglected the uh, coupling to impurities because even if there is a coupling of impurities, although the, peak sh the graph shape uh, uh, shows that it's probably not true, that uh, shouldn't be anisotropic. While the coupling to optical phonons, uh, it is very natural to assume that it's anisotropic in this model because the structure is anisotropic. So the deformation potential, uh, we can assume that it will be different along B and C directions. So we use this formula uh, to fit these two dependencies. And in this slide, uh, you can see the uh, fitting parameters. Uh, the, uh, this is the uh, zero for the head maximum, and these two are the most important parameters. This gamma LO is the coupling strength. So you can see that the coupling is stronger along B, direc B direction. And that's why the peaks along B directions are broader. Also, we uh, found out that the uh, phonon energy in, this to, in uh, the coupling to phonons. These phonons have different uh, different uh, phonon energy uh, along B and C direction, although the difference is not significant and this can be just caused by an error. Uh, but this, uh, the, these two numbers are different uh, uh, even considering the error. Uh, then uh, the interesting fact is these numbers that we got from this fitting, the phonons that are participating coupling. Normally, uh, the coupling happens to this H of phonons that are vibrations on the inorganic sublattice and must be at around uh, 10 to 15 uh, milli electron volts. While the numbers we got are higher. We tried to uh, make an assignment of the peaks with this energy from Raman uh, spectra. And uh, uh, these uh, peaks that have around the same wave number uh, the, those are the peaks that their their intensity changes with uh, temperature, similar to the project one. As you remember, this is the vibration that involves the uh, NH end of the organic molecule, and so it involves hydrogen bonding. So, although those moles are vibrations of the organic sublattice, they are uh, the most tightly bonded, the most uh, uh, penetrated into the inorganic uh, sublattice. So, it's also natural to expect that there is some coupling with this uh, uh, organic phonons, although there are several uh, evidences uh, that this happens in here. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, uh, since uh, the uh, full weight of half maximum is different, uh, this uh, um, and broadening happens to the right, right side of the spectrum, 
they are more broader peak will be a bit uh, more redshift between first and the more narrow peak. And uh, this can contribute to the difference in the uh, field position. Uh, and project number three uh, is about high pressure study of uh, particular to the perovskite, where the, where the organic sublattice uh, uh, is uh, long and soft and uh, um, uh, about high pressure. Uh, first, uh, before speaking about high pressure, since this is not a very common technique, I will just give a little bit of, of introduction of why and how we perform high pressure experiments. So, um, there are these two publications I added here. It's the examples how high pressure can be, can be used. Uh, this one is more related to my work, and it shows that uh, within quite a moderate pressure range, using high pressure, we can uh, change the color of uh, photoluminescence, and also we can reach emission enhancement. And uh, uh, this mission enhancement on high pressure can achieve 180,000 times. And uh, another recent example of how, how high pressure is important is uh, that uh, about a few months ago, there was this uh, publication about frost near the room temperature semiconductor that uh, can operate at 50, uh, 15 uh, Celsius degrees, although uh, at 260 uh, gigapascal, that is 2.6 million atmosphere. Uh, then uh, why do we need uh, such a high uh, um, uh, pressure? Uh, so the first reason of this application is uh, simple high pressure synthesis. The second reason is to study the structure and properties relation because high pressure is a very direct way to uh, affect or alter the structure and so we can see how the properties depend on these changes. And uh, the third uh, uh, reason, uh, maybe the most important, is that we can find some, some very special properties, and we can get some clue how to achieve these properties at ambient condition making. And it can work as a guideline for chemists uh, to synthesize, to find out this new material, for example, in temperature semiconductor. And the next slide is about how we perform this experiment. Uh, we use uh, the device called Diamond Fentanyl Cell. It's actually quite a small device, it's about this size. There are two diamonds inside. This is its skin. And we put the sample between these two diamonds. We add some pressure medium, it's a liquid usually, or some soft powder, and the ruby as a, a pressure reference. And uh, uh, start to compress, measure ruby, you know the pressure, and then the study the properties of the material that we want to study. And this is how the uh, gasket, the sample, looks loaded in the DVC. This slide is, is about what material we are studying this project. Uh, it's also a 2D, 2D perovskite, like I added, but the organic tank is a very long, it has 16 carbon atoms. Uh, and um, uh, for this kind of, of materials, the difference in mechanical properties between organic and inorganic is about 10 times. Uh, so we load it, in, it into the diamond uh, cell and uh, the first thing I want you to look at is how the color changes, how dramatically the color can change with the, with the properties. We started this yellow, uh, very light color, and then uh, when the pressure reaches seven, it's already black, it's already absorbed most of the light. And this is how strongly the band gap is affected by the pressure. Then uh, to spectroscopy. Uh, using uh, Raman spectroscopy and also optical spectroscopy, the first thing that we figured out about this material is there is a phase transition at uh, the pressure around 0 0.8 GPA. You can see that the Raman spectra are corresponding to the inorganic vibration changes in this range dramatically. And also uh, between 0 and 0 0.9, the vibrations of the organic ions also change. A uh, similar uh, change appears in the optical absorption and photoluminescence spectra. Around the same pressure, there is a significant blue shift of the properties. So the first uh, conclusion here is a phase transition at a relatively low pressure. And uh, the second conclusion is that when the pressure continue increase, uh, starting uh, roughly at about 1.5 GP, there are some additional changes that are not very clear observed from the organic vibrations. Uh, so it's not so straightforward a phase transition, but these changes can be seen. And these changes are additional peak or peaks appearing in the lower uh, energy regions. Here, not 
you know, but you can see that the peak is not one peak anymore. Uh, this is not uh, something very new. Some other materials also can exhibit it, but also not every tutti perovskite, only, only some of them. And normally where the uh, organic cation is, is an aliphatic chain. And uh, then we try to study the uh, nature of the traditional peaks, and uh, we figured out that at high pressure, uh, instead of one homogeneous uh, 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 crystal, as it used to be a zero decay, uh, we have a very wide variety of photoluminescent spectra. These different colors in this light correspond to different uh, positions of the main peak. So, uh, for example, this uh, region number one uh, is the most blue shifted, region number three is the most red shifted, and so on. And this uh, uh, let us call it domains, they are conserved under pressure. Uh, at a higher pressure, we also have several components, and the main contributing component is, uh, is conserved. Uh, another interesting thing that we found out that even after the pressure is released, we still um, uh, have some inhomogeneous in the center. Uh, so some parts of the crystal, they are perfectly reversible, same peak, same position, and some of them are not. And some of them, the main contribution happens from the, high, uh, from the lower energy peak. Uh, you may, uh, may want to ask that whether it's uh, really reversible or it's just I didn't wait long enough. Uh, but uh, I tried to wait for a week. I tried to heat it up. These changes, uh, don't, nothing, nothing happens to these changes. Uh, so there is something in the structure that, hap that happens in some part of the crystal and in the other part of the crystal that just don't happen. Uh, and um, it can be defects, the very first uh, conclusion, of course. Uh, uh, but it also can be a mixture of phases. At, uh, and uh, if it's a mixture of phases, it means that uh, there is some uh, different structures. And uh, uh, we used the Raman spectroscopy to determine whether there is this mixture of phases or not. And uh, so this is a Raman peak up under 1.7 dpa. And there are, uh, uh, I, I picked up two points where the, Raman pe uh, the PL peaks are very different. Like here, uh, this is a very uh, blue shifted, this is very red shifted. And here are the corresponding Raman spectrum, these two points. And you can see that there is a change. It's, uh, the positions of the main peak don't change much, so it means uh, it probably shows that there is not much difference in the pressure. But the, there are additional peaks that can show that there is additional uh, structure. And um, the changes in the organic uh, uh, vibration are also presented. Uh, like not, not very very obvious, but uh, this peak and this peak intensity, this peak shifted a bit. And uh, then after pressure released, I also measured Raman of two regions with very different uh, optical properties, and uh, the uh, Raman spectra again are very different. You can see that in this red spectrum, it's uh, this peak shifted. Although the pressure is completely released, the PC is open. And uh, same, there is an additional peak uh, in the uh, vibrations of the organic uh, peak. So um, making a brief conclusion here is that there are some changes in the optical properties, and these changes are related to the difference in the structure. So we have some kind of, of mixed phases that create domains in the structure. Yeah, then uh, the next slide is mainly a hypothesis. Uh, we try to explain why this happens, and this the scheme shows uh, the uh, schematic uh, uh, structure and the uh, uh, and, uh, uh, corresponding uh, back structure. So at uh, room temperature before compression, we have a straight uh, uh, um, uh, uh, HDA uh, chains and only one transition. Then when compression happens, this organic, very soft uh, substructure, it has so many ways on how it can respond to the, to the pressure. If uh, in the simplest uh, example, it can be, for example, bending of these chains, but in different positions, different atoms in different parts of the structure. Or uh, it, it's just an example. There can be some other changes because there are a lot of uh, uh, degrees of freedom. And so it's different, let's call it bending, uh, causes uh, different uh, distortions in the inorganic layer, and so different uh, 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 bad structure. That's why we have different transitions, both in PL and optical. So this slide is conclusions, the general conclusion of the work is that 
the uh, organic matter affects the properties of two different skies in many different ways. And depending on the organic attacks, we can find some very specific and unique properties that can be only found in this very uh, deep rock sky thing through this very organic attack. Uh, uh, so uh, we have shown how the hydrogen bonding and order and disordering conditions in uh, uh, two deep rock skies uh, are related to optical properties. We have shown that uh, the same corrugated deep rock skies, there is in plane anisotropy, including the anisotropy of coupling exciton and coupling, and uh, uh, the, in the last project we found out that there is a kind of domain structure under pressure uh, that, um, uh, and this additional, uh, this uh, domain structure provides us one more way of tunability. So in fact we run one uh, crystal, same conditions, but different optical properties. And this can be a good way, a good uh, uh, idea for applications if we can uh, uh, realize these properties under uh, ambient conditions. And this is one of the future plans. Future plans. We want to continue this project to try to find the materials under ambient that can exhibit similar structure under ambient conditions. And also to uh, to have some additional studies uh, on the origin of this domain structure. Uh, the second idea for the future project that we are going to have with uh, Paul Hanna is about uh, continue uh, study disorder in deep rock skies. That is uh, particularly the disorder of the uh, organic, um, large organic cations. Because we, uh, using NMR, we have found out that a thin bromonium cation can actually have uh, be presented in two different transformers. And that, that is the uh, reason or consequence of this disorder. And uh, also we have found out that there is some water. And this disorder can be related to water absorption, although the two different skies are believed to be more or less uh, resistant to water. And uh, yeah, and we are going to study a number of different skies where this disorder can be presented. And uh, finally, for the, the other idea for the future project is uh, instead of using the insulating organic cations, we can also use the organic cations that are uh, semiconductors themselves. This can improve the uh, interlayer uh, charge transfer, layer transfer, and also it can be a way to tune the uh, or improve the intensity of photoluminescence. Yeah, this is all. Uh, thank you for listening. In this slide, you can see uh, uh, people who helped me a lot during their, uh, my PhD study, including my supervisor, uh, my TC members who helped a lot. And uh, I also had a uh, pleasure to work with a lot of collaborators. Uh, who contributed to my work a lot, and I hope that I was able to help them too. Uh, and uh, uh, also had a chance to travel and to attend several internships, and also many thanks to people who made this possible. And uh, all my group members, friends, and family uh, who supported me socially. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay. here is a list of list of publications. That I Assume it's hydrostatic because it's never perfectly hydrostatic, but okay, so we try to meet it. Uh, could these changes be, could these domains occur just because there was one particle of the powder here which is more strongly pushing the one side of the of the crystal 
or something like that. How big is this um, crystal anyway? Yeah, so this crystal is about uh, 50 to 100 to micron size, and it is in, li in liquid. It's so in liquid. this case, it's in liquid, and the properties are the same. It doesn't matter if it's liquid or powder. So, uh, I mean, this can be a case when it's more like strain rather than pressure, when it's uh, when uh, it can be compression rather than electrostatic pressure. But anyway, in this case, it's liquid. And uh, no matter how thin, how thick, how big is the crystal, it appears at the time of processing. Although, of course, the domains are kind of random, but they always appear. Any other questions? So this um, this diagram you've got on the top of the corner, the 3.2 gigapascals, that's just representative of that 3.2 gigapascal experiment. Um, does, does that, do these domains change with pressure? Um, so are these are <laughs> so this is changing. These domains are changing with pressure. Uh, they are. Um, I mean, the borders can shift a little bit, but general, uh, the, let's say this domain is uh, the one that has the most blue shifted. Uh, peak, the, the next pressure is the one will still have the most blue shifted peak. But of course, each of the domains have its own uh, evolution of pressure. Like uh, here, for example, um, uh, this peak, when the pressure increase, goes down, but it is still the main peak. Right. Like this peak was the main peak, but it goes up with pressure, but yeah. it's still the main peak. Yeah. <coughs> but of course, there's, there's definitely hysteresis in the system, it never goes back to where uh, yeah, but we, this is only with increased pressure. When the pressure decreases, yeah, you need to wait long, and uh, it's, uh, it's not really. Okay, so, do you understand in, in, in this model how you get red shift of the peaks? Mm -hmm. I mean, the blue shift I understand, yeah. but the red shift. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, first of all, there is a phase transition during which happens a uh, blue shift, mm -hmm. right? And then, uh, this phase transition for the other materials, it is related to the bending of, the, uh, right. of uh, this chain. So, uh, depending on the bending, some bending that can happen uh, maybe in the most energetically stable, it causes like this very blue shift. But the other one can cause less blue shift, and the other one can, can Right. How do you oh, actually, I mean, you need to increase this between the planes, right? Uh, during the first condition, we don't have a push shift, we have a red shift. Mm. We have a red shift. So, so it's either more red shift or less red shift. I see. It's always red shift. It's always red shift. Yeah. Uh -huh. After the first condition. So you don't have a comparison? Yeah, I see. I see. So 500. So Again, this theory about bending, uh, it's, it's, it's an idea. No, no, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes I was sense. trying to see if you really mm -hmm. saw a, a redshift compared to the original one. Would be harder to... Again, it's redshift uh, depending on the uh, angle between the tachyhedra and after the transition, the tachyhedra become less distorted. But again, depending on where the bending happens, it's less, less, or more, less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Just now they mentioned whether the pressure is a uniform, right? Yes. If you have a solid, uh, if uh, the thickness is not the same, right? how can you imagine the pressure in the same? Because to, to, to the rubbish to calibrate it. Right? Yeah, to avoid this question, we, we first of all, we use a liquid. That at least within the some pressure range, it remains a liquid. So, and this happens in the liquid. 
of course, it's not perfectly. Uh, I mean, there there can be some pressure relations. No, 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 no question about it. But uh, uh, these pressure relations shouldn't be related to such a significant changes. So there can be like uh, an error, maybe zero point one, because like I, I never actually like uh, we can measure pressure more precisely, but I never say that this is this precise. Maybe it's more like ATP and with some variations. But yeah, uh, just to the just the uh, um, general question, uh -huh. you not only liquid, right? You also use it for solid samples, right? Including materials that are placed in liquid. Uh, every experiment is in liquid. Not every. Most of the experiment are liquid. Only for Raman experiment, we have to use uh, uh, some other ways because uh, the sil silicon oil, as we use it as a liquid, has some additional peaks and it covers the Raman of the sample. But, but even the liquid, different thickness that you have, right? Uh, solid different thickness of, of liquid? Or like this, uh, of the sample. Of the sample? Uh, it can be different thickness or can be not different thickness uh, in. Uh, Again, I performed many experiments, and uh, uh, oh, it's a general question. Uh, general question. Okay, general question. Uh, again, uh, theoretically, the, since the pressure is hydrostatic, that uh, should get more or less similar pressure. But yeah, because the in, inside of the solid, the pressure distribution can already be different. But it's it's less. Uh, the difference is less than the difference between one GPA and eight GPA. Much less. So then basically, how do you calibrate the, how much pressure you put? Is it the, uh, you have some calibration? We, right? we use Ruby as yeah. calibration. So yeah, Ruby can be thinner, thicker, but again, it, it will not give an error of 1 GPA. I see. Uh, but 1 GPA is a lot. It, it will give much less error. <laughs> yeah. And the step that I usually take is uh, more significant. Provided by my collaborator, all of them. Most of the samples are in uh, like crystals, single crystals, and for most of the experiments, I used ex exfoliation to get a fresh surface. Like here, uh, uh, it's not necessarily like exfoliation with the tape, but uh, at least I try to to break it to, to get a fresh surface. I think like this is one of the optical images for one of the other samples I also have. Image. Yeah, like this uh, single crystal, this is not exfoliated. So for, for the second project with anisotropic, there, there is, uh, the layers are bonded to each other very uh, strongly, so it's not possible to exfoliate this. So in this uh, sample, this from the second, uh, the anisotropic one, it was a single crystal, and for the first project, this is how it looked, it was exfoliated. But how do you prepare your single crystal? Uh, um, again, it was done by my collaborators, but in general, it's solution grown. It can be, depending on the sample, it can be either uh, a water solution of uh, uh, like HI, or it can be some DMSO solution. Uh, is it an uh, isotopic uh, optical study, Raman study? So from the polarization, uh, you say it's a uh, different axis of phone coupling, right? Yes. Um, but you again you said uh, the phonons are basically the same as roughly the same as the rest. So um, yeah. for each Raman peak, I, I, can you uh, identify which is the shear mode and breaking mode and which uh, mode, which atom is causing that? Uh, yes, we can. And uh, for these two peaks that can contribute to the coupling, uh, this is torsion of any street side. Okay. So then from the polarization, you can say uh, what information can you get? Yeah, uh, polarization of these modes, uh, I'm not sure I have it. The, uh, from polarization of the uh, exit. So the excitons can be uh, uh, the uh, polarization of the excitation laser uh, is different. So then, um, so 
what happens uh, that causes uh, different uh, uh, so it it uh, causes all the vibrations right but some of them is uh, uh, stronger and some weaker depending on this uh, on this graphs right but it's not only the uh, exciton the phonons and phonon populations that we have this is the coupling strengths that is uh, uh, dependent on this model that is related to the anisotropy of the structure. I, I had a related question. Mm -hmm. So why the directions of this um, uh, organic vibration somehow, right? It's related to the end of the chain. And the inorganic lattice are in the same direction. I mean, from the graph, from the previous graph, they don't need to happen in the same orientation, right? Which graph? Uh, the, the, the orientation map. Ah. Yeah, this is not like the vibrations are called things, they don't happen in the same direction. Right, but, but from here it looks like they are. And, and, um, and yeah, when you, when you come to your model and you find that they are related to this organic, that explains the inequality <coughs> of the coupling. Yeah, but again, this uh, this doesn't mean that it happened in this direction. They are excited by the laser in this direction, and it all it's, it's it's more complex. It's not that straightforward. It's more related to the Raman tensor and to symmetry. So it's not just that straightforward. But this formula for the yeah. So it depends on the Raman tensor. So the vibration can be very complex. It it, it happens on the three three directions. It's just the particular ladder polarization will excite it uh, with a stronger um, intensity or weaker. So if a, if a preferential excitation of, of yes. that vibration in that Yes, direction. but the vibration doesn't mean that it is in the same direction. It, it has preferable excitation. Uh, yeah, so then, it, then obviously you will see the coupling that's related to that direction. Is that true? Um, I mean, you can't see anything else. Uh, I mean, you use this argument to say that it's related to the organic. But uh, if this is correct, which I'm not completely sure. Yeah, again, the, the excitation happens along one right. of the direction. One, but then the vibrations, the okay, vibration, no. for example, distortion, it, it, we can't right. see it happens in a particular direction. Right? Right. It's, it's the vibration that can happen, that can cause distortions and some strains in the structure right. that doesn't happen to right. be in the very same direction. Right. But, but so why the peak? Why don't you have? another preferential direction for the excitation of the Raman peak. You see, if I'm supposing when you put the, the, the polarization in the right direction of the vibration, in the proper direction, you should get a maximum, right? Mm. So it, sorry, it's I don't like get it, what you mean. It seems a coincidence to me that the vibration, the, the, the peak of the of the organic vibrations corresponds to the orientation of the organic lattice. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's this corresponds, some don't correspond. It depends on the symmetry and Raman right. tensor. That, that's what you get from the corrugation or, or whatever, right? Uh, the, the top one. Yeah, it's, it, it's not necessary to be corrugated. It should be just yeah, okay. the, uh, yeah, some, some symmetry right. breaking. But yeah. the bottom one should not be, I mean, does not need to be in that direction. Right? This, this one? Yeah. Uh, some are, it's, I think it depends on the symmetry of the tensor. Yeah, but, but it's a coincidence that, that the symmetries are the same, right? Uh, it's it's it, it is a consequence from this space from the symmetry group. As I understand this. Well, it's just yeah, that, that's my question. I mean, what, yeah. what, it doesn't need the, the group symmetry of the of the organic lattice doesn't need to be the same as the molecule, right? Uh, no, no. And it's not. Ah, you mean for for the yes, organic yes. and inorganic? Uh, the this group is a symmetry of the, of the whole structure. And so it, it is quite a low symmetry already. So I think here is important the entire crystal is important that's all connected. Because uh, both inorganic and organic vibrations can be either AG or BG. And for this uh, symmetry, there is no. And it's not like the octahedra probably, like we can't con uh, consider octahedra separately. They are, even if we consider only the octahedra, they will be quite a low symmetry. Yeah, no, I'm considering the, the anisotropic yeah. direction, which is the one you see there. I, I don't think it's just a coincidence. I think it's an, uh, it's all 
happens from the symmetry, from the groups, the theory, and the groups. So it's either the same direction or it's uh, like exactly 45 degrees. I mean, that, that means that if you put the same inorganic ligand in two different structures, you will get two different Raman modes. Same inorganic ligand. Same organic. Same organic. In two different uh, transcribed structures. Yeah, because it will more depend on the orientation. From the, from the, for the molecule? Uh, I think it more depends on the entire structure symmetry of, this, of the tree stuff. Because if we don't consider just the symmetry of the organic molecules, it's just the symmetry all together. And if they're but the like bromine. But the modes that you see are specific to the molecule, right? You can yeah. either, you know, you just show that you can correlate the actual. They are coupled to the. Right, they are coupled, the yeah, which is what you want to see. but. My, my, my point is you can't use that argument to say that uh, it's a proof that that is the... Is the uh, is I, the I, I don't use this argument to explain the exciton quantum coupling. This is actually mainly, uh, first of all, to show that the structure is yeah, allotropic, yeah. and secondly, this is a, a, just a good way to almost instantly determine the rotation of the crystal yeah, in yeah. the study. No, no, so this makes is, sense, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I don't say that like that this is long C, that means, no, this is... Uh, there are some uh, fundamental questions. Uh, first, mm -hmm. we, we, we imagine an uh, experiment at, for, uh, at uh, high pressure, okay? Mm -hmm. Imagine that the sample is uh, perfect two dimension. Uh, you mentioned that uh, sometimes you use liquid, sometimes you don't use liquid, you direct uh, apply pressure on the sample. Oh. So if we consider the pressure the effect of pressure on the optical protein. Is there any difference if you use liquid or don't use liquid? liquid? Yes, so in this situation, as you say, like if we apply di directly, we actually never apply directly. We have to use some pressure with you. Or, a very, or in the case of a very thick crystal, yeah, it, it's true. But we always use either the li uh, liquid or powder that also can create more, I mean, just because the powder is oriented in all directions, it also create more or less hydrostatic pressure. It's not completely same, but this all is approaching to the hydrostatic pressure. In case of liquid, it's, it's just better approaching to the hydrostatic pressure. And if we directly just take one crystal, uh, and uh, just compress, it will be more like strain rather than pressure, because pressure should be from the all directions. But if you consider powder, okay, with liquid, you can consider that the pressure is in all directions. Mm -hmm. However, if you don't use the liquid, your pressure is only in one direction. So that will make difference. Yes, some. Um, but again, for powder, because it's uh, oriented in all directions, and average, it will be more or less the same. But yeah, it's, it's not the same with you. Okay, so the, the, the next, can you go back to uh, slide six? Yeah, in the introduction part, you mentioned that uh, uh, for 2D uh, hybrid perovskite, uh, the uh, uh, stability is improved. Can you explain why? Why, uh, why for 2D is more stable? In, you know, not all of them, but in general, this organic layer, mm -hmm. uh, it's hydrophobic. That's why it protects, uh, like, like oil, it protects against moisture. Uh -huh. Although, as we found out, it's not completely true, but it, it protects, like, for example, this sample, which can be stored in air one, air, one year, nothing happens. And the more interesting is about the C16 perovskite. It's so much protected against moisture that it just don't dissolve in water at all. You can put it in water, nothing happens. It was used, uh, like frost, it was used as uh, completely hydrophobic material. So it's uh, moisture stability, I should probably add it the word moisture. For example, illumination stability can be worse. But moisture stability is an improve because of hydrophobicity of the organic molecules. Okay, so then following this question, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, how high is the barrier? Because you, you, you mentioned that for 2D perovskite, it uh, behaves like a uh, quantum wear. Yep. Then for the quantum wear, then what is the barrier height? 
Yeah, so for, it depends on the organic molecule, but normally uh -huh. it's more than 5 EV for the organic pair. No, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not asking the number. I'm asking, <laughs> where's the barrier from? Uh, from the different uh, band gap in the, uh, this layer, that is actually an insulator in the particular vehicle range design, so it's different in the, for the uh, uh, semiconducting Do, do you have any idea of the band alignment? If, because uh, it's, it, it's critical. Uh, for a quantum wear, if you need to consider the band alignment between the quantum wear and the barrier. Yes, I don't have this feature, but normally it's like the conduction band minimum and valence band maximum. For the semiconductor, it will be like this, and for the organic molecule, it will be like this. So, so you, you know, if you have, uh, because of quantum wear, if you consider the type one quantum wear, then the alignment is very important because uh, for electrons and holes, you have different uh, effective mass. And uh, then for the, con if you consider the offset, if more, Band gap is the uh, offset is in conduction band. <laughs> Maybe that will provide a different optical properties. Yeah, I think in this case it just simply means that the uh, the real band gap is determined by the inorganic uh, atoms only, only by lead and only by iodine and bromine. The organic just the, there are no there is no electron density in the organic. Okay, it should be very high. On both yes, it is. It's it's like five, uh, even more. Okay, if it's uh, five, then for quantum wear it's uh, two, then I think, uh, yeah, you, 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 you can take it as infinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, so you do, okay, yeah. Okay, and uh, can you go back to 14? So I noticed that the, the, the PL peak is even higher than the optical absorption, the exciton. Uh, uh, so that, that's strange. This is excitonic optical absorption H. The sample, uh, so that's why I called it H. Uh, it was uh, the uh, excitonic peak was quite broad and not very symmetrical due to the, uh, all this, I think all, all the samples were too thick and there was some absorption, so the peak shape was, was complicated. So I didn't fit the uh, exit, the absorption uh, uh, spectrum entire one. I just took the age, because for here I didn't, like, um, uh, it wasn't so important about the exact energy. I just wanted to show that it also changes. So instead of the real energy, I took the age of the exit energy. So I just used the linear fit for this, for this age of the exit energy not of the band age itself. Okay, in, in, in that fitting, what is EA? Uh, EA? Uh -huh. It's activation energy of uh, some non-recombination process that happens in the nature. It, it's, it's not it's, the external band energy? Uh, we, we can say, if there are defects, it can be defects. Or it can be external band energy. I mean, 250 is uh, with an arrow, it's still a little bit high for excitonic band energy in this material. But maybe this is the excitonic band energy, while at uh, lower temperature it is uh, some defects are created. And uh, th there is another recombination mechanism. Mm -hmm. we, we, want to to, we wanted to study, like to, to use some additional uh, methods to, to study it. There, uh, so we don't know the exact recombination mechanism. But uh, one yeah, thing may be excitonic band energy. Yeah, actually, your, your, your answer is correct. because. <laughs> Why I mentioned this because many people just misunderstood that uh, ah, this is okay. just the exciting band energy because mm -hmm. uh, they don't consider the non uh, recombination uh, centers. So they just consider that the increased temperature will dissociate the exciton. Yeah. So that's uh, actually wrong. So your, your answer is, uh, is, is correct. Okay. So next, can you go to 28? Uh, no, 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 29, sorry. Yes. Okay. 
if you consider the optical absorption and uh, photoluminescence, can you see that uh, they are correlated or just uh, consistent? If you look at, uh, for example, if you look at the pressure, okay, so for optical absorption, when the pressure is more than 1.57, uh, then they have uh, almost, uh, yeah, between 0 0.85 to 1.57, the uh, structure is uh, the same. However, for photoluminescence, when you change the pressure from 0 0.79 to 0 0.8, Seven, then there is a sudden change of the photoluminescence. Yeah, true. I, I got the question. This is uh, okay. First of all, this change uh, about zero point eight is a phase transition. There is a sudden change here, and there is a sudden change here. So this phase transition corresponds to this phase transition. Then what happened next? Mm -hmm. It involves this complicated process with domains, and these two graphs were measured from two different experiments. And uh, so, and from two different domains. It's just a general picture without this, before we start to speak about domains. But still, like, uh, for example, this additional component starts to appear in. in uh, so, across uh, the whole uh, pressure range, how many phase change occur? Uh, there how is definitely times? one uh, normal, let's say, normal phase transition that happens uh -huh. at 0 0.8 degree. Uh -huh. Then at high pressure, something strange starts to happen with these domains, with these different structures, with these uh, phases that coexist together. And this is very much sample dependent, this is very even position dependent. Oh. So uh, uh, I would say that uh, there, there, there is a kind of phase transition that also happens here, but it's very much dependent on these domains and on this uh, degrees of freedom that makes this exchange chain. And this is like the, the interesting part about these domains. and they. Uh, Generally, like uh, uh, something starts to appear almost after the phase transition. So the domain structure can be only start after the phase transition. And the phase transition can be related to this bending in different parts. It's, uh, uh, so the normal phase transition is one, and then this uh, unusual effects appear. And also there is uh, one more phase transition of oxidation at 20 plus. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so if no other questions, uh, yes, yeah. I have your uh, whole demo question about the uh, half pressure equipment. Can you come to the two cells? Um, yeah, since I use the rookie to test the uh, um, pressure you put on your sample, uh, the question is why you need the rookie to test it? I mean, that uh, you give the force of the demo, uh, can you set the pressure number uh, on this equipment, or is different? Uh, is different between the um, pressure you set and it actually on the sample? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. If you have never worked with this before, so the idea is that uh, the way we apply the pressure is very mechanical, and you cannot measure exactly how much you apply it uh, because okay. it's um, so how it looks. There, there is um, so two diamonds, mm -hmm. and uh, there is this casket between them, and then we pressed uh, these two diamonds using this uh, the metal part of DC, and there are this a lot of it's like some small discs okay. that uh, are actually compressed, and uh, there are four screws here. So in theory, yeah, depending on how much you have tightened the screw, the pressure will be higher, but it is so much inaccurate. While the ruby can uh, allow you to determine pressure up to 0 0.1 or even more accurately. Okay. So in fact, when you start to compress, you don't know the pressure. Yeah, you need a bit can feel, like you can feel the difference between 0 0.3 GPA when it's loose and like 20 GPA when it's really, really hard to tighten it. But it's uh, not too accurate. Okay. So we need ruby. Uh, two quick questions. One is from me and one from one examiner. So mine is, is perhaps naive, but why the excitons you don't see replicas? Uh, you mean the PL excitons? Yeah, in the, in the, yeah, PL, PL in zone. Yeah, good, good question. I also had this question. Maybe they're just uh, not low not enough there. temperature? And the polar... Well, they go very low in, in 
AT cover. In, in, for example, in some materials, uh, similar to the skies, to see this replic colors uh, with the result, they need to go to like, the far cover. At yeah, that, so we are sure that, 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 for instance, the Z2 that we see is not a replica of E1. Uh, again, we don't know exactly what is ST and E2, and looks like no one knows. It looks like separated. As I could show a few points. Yeah, but if you look at the separation, at least you should know it because uh, that's not the full. So there was a publication that, this, that when they yes. really see the replicas, and the separation was almost about saying like 35 right. MOV. And uh, in the first paper, they said this is just for non replicas. In this next paper, they say the additional peak is by exodon and the loop, and they say in the very same material. And in the next paper, they say that this is not just replicas, this is polarons. And, uh, 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 but even in their papers, mostly they studied uh, absorption. Some of them also studied PL, but it can be that if, if it's not replicas, if it's more like polarons, as I understand, and they don't necessarily have this uh, like uh, kind of same. Well, it shouldn't be at the right uh, energy. Right? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Uh, but, but again, this is a, this is. I think it's kind of question that is uh, new yeah, papers yeah, appear no, on this question. Since you did all the model with three oscillators. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting, the origin of this. Uh, the question from the examiner here is, uh, sorry, we are jumping back and forth, is that again about the pressure? And the question says, uh, similar effects were observed in uh, uh, shorter chains, C8 and C12, uh, from a reference that yeah, didn't visit. Sure. Uh, so I was wondering, or he or she is wondering if uh, there is a correlation between the length of the chain and the uh, uh, So, uh, yeah. The first fact is happens not in any material, only with the, with the long, long, long chains. Uh, so secondly, uh, uh, the correlation can be, as I understand, the, the separation of the peaks, but the mechanism is the same. Uh -huh. It's just softer, the longer chain, the more degrees of freedom we have. And uh, at the previous works, yeah, they did observe additional peaks, but I don't remember any single work where they did this mapping and found So they didn't see domains? I, 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 I didn't see domains. Yeah, I, I saw in the longer, sh shorter, uh, they also have additional peaks appearing. So it's the like only the thing you can compare is, uh, is, uh, is how much it shifts, essentially, right? Uh, the distance Yeah, and I think not only how much it shifts, it's also how, on how many different, how, how many peaks you can have. Oh, they did observe several peaks? The, yeah, uh -huh. I observe uh, several peaks, sometimes like more than three. But sorry, did you do different chain lengths? No. Uh, no, I'm not with yeah. one. But uh, we also want to try different lengths, and the first test with like with two, with a mixed with two lengths, and uh, and also with some uh, oxygen in some positions. So we have to have the how to study. Okay, that that would be interesting. Okay, yes. so if uh, no other questions, we put in cooperation. We will have a closer discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, with me. Without you. Without you. Later.